Welcome to Supercharged by AI, a podcast by AI Portland. I am Megan Notarte, co-founder of AI Portland and partner at Cloud4. I'm joined by Nicole Moores, my AI Portland co-founder and product design manager at Driveway. Today, we have a very special guest that Nicole and I are so excited to bring to the podcast. We've got Janet Johnson, founder of the AI Governance Group and all around very cool and impressive person. Thank you, Janet, for joining us today. Welcome to our really cool podcast. I'm so excited. I can't imagine being able to be here with you two because I think, talk about cool, what you're doing is just amazing. And so I'm really honored to be part of your podcast and and really excited about the conversation today. So rock and roll, right? Yeah. yeah. Let's start out and tell us how you got into AI and what the AI governance group is all about. Like, how did you get here to this moment? Well, do you want 50 years? Let's go 50 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. Okay. So 50 years ago, I took my first, actually, it's 51 years ago now. I took my first cell phone call as an operator, a summertime operator when I was in high school for AT&T. And I was just completely blown away by the fact that I was talking to somebody in their car. I mean, you got to remember this was like, this was at a time where, you know, there were no, no computers, no nothing practically, right? And so here I am, you know, 16 year old girl in Kelso, Washington, thinking I'm hot stuff. And suddenly talking to a guy and in his car. So I I really quickly realized that I was fascinated and really interested in technology. And so, you know, fast forward to 1984, the year of the Mac, I actually started working in technology, uh, selling computers on the retail floor, which was really kind of wild. And I realized really quickly that I became kind of a person who could explain tough things or more, you know, interesting things without talking to an engineer, I can explain stuff to people and have it come out okay. So over the years, I just kind of stayed really deeply in the technology part of computers that I was selling. I worked for Apple as a business development manager for a while with enterprise clients like Nike and Minter Graphics and, and folks like that. And And really enjoyed being able to describe why these things worked and why people would actually want to buy computers for their business at the time. And then, you know, fast forward after seven or eight years of doing that, I went to a software company and became a product manager. And that's where I learned where you have to make products that are useful to people. And I I have to tell you... um, I became really interested in the power of two-way conversations on the web when social media came. Before people could spell blog, we were playing around in that space. And, you know, right after that, and this is why I'm in AI, I'm sorry, this is a really long conversation, but... Um, we love it. We are here for this. Okay. Thank you for your for your indulgence here. But after social media started the power of two-way conversations online, you know, social media experts kind of came out of the woodwork. Everybody who was a consultant at the time was a social media consultant. And I realized really quickly that people take advantage of themes and they take advantage of tech. And when I saw, here's when we finally get to AI, when I saw the the advent of ChatGPT in 2022, I guess it was now November, I realized, holy Moses, we're going to be in for another trip, right? Because over the last 20 years, since social's been on the scene, you know, we've had this huge upheaval in trust and transparency and truth. And I really see that we're going to have the same kind of upheaval, um, only accelerate. It's not going to take 20 years for the same kind of um, changes that will happen to society, probably most likely the workforce at the time. And so, you know, it's been a little over a year. I started the AI governance group with a group of uh, mostly women, but some really cool men coming together with, you know, legal expertise. Three of us are attorneys, not I, but three three of my team are attorneys, you know, brand and, and business builders. We've all been C-level folks. We've got a machine learning guy who's a data scientist who's really afraid of losing his job and becoming mm-hmm. irrelevant. If you can imagine that, right? Right. And then um, 
So we formed the AI Governance Group, and we're all about helping businesses make their way into AI safely and understand deeply how to protect their employees, protect their IP, and protect the organization's reputation and, and brand itself as they adopt these tools because they don't want to not adopt them. We got to get people going on them. So that's why I'm so grateful to you two for starting AI Portland and really, you know, getting the word out and doing things like you're doing, you know, soon around like just having a non-technical discussion around AI. And last week when you had your, and the last podcast, which was awesome, by the way, when you had your prompt engineering gal come in and and boy those downloads are awesome too so you guys are doing great work and I'm really excited and grateful to you for it thank you I I appreciate that and it is one of the things that I think both Nicole and I feel really strongly about and I and you share this as well Janet is that like this tech is here and for a very long time it's been limited to just technical folks but with the advent of chat GPT and other tools like that now it's in the collective mainstream and It's like, y'all need to understand what's happening because it is going to impact your job in some way. And let's understand that and let's make that a positive impact instead of a scary, I'm going to lose my job impact. Yeah. In my mind, there is like this continuum of how people feel about AI. It goes from fear to techno optimism, right? So there's the people (laughs) who are just super terrified for very good reason And then there are those people who are just so optimistic that they don't care at all about the things that people are terrified about. And they think it's like only going to be good for us. Where do you find yourself? Because when I hear you say things about the AI governance group and how you're like protecting employees and protecting companies and protecting data, my first thought is like, oh, oh, Janet must be more towards the pearl clutching side than the optimist side. But where do you find yourself? Okay, so I'm going to put it in shortcut words. Here yes. are the folks, and I'm glad this is a podcast because I'm going to make a rude gesture in a moment. There's the <laughs> yay AI team, yes. and then there's the yikes AI team, right? <laughs> That's right. And I have to say, I oscillate vastly between the two, depending. When I first saw this stuff come out, I really quickly went from, oh my God, we're in trouble you know, the yikes AI side of things, pearl clutching, as you've said, which I, that's hilarious. But also, you know, quickly, you know, the more you use it, the more you realize, my gosh, this is a great tool. These tools are amazing. So I use them every day. I am uh, very pro. The fact is, like you said, the horse is out of the barn. We are on our track. We are on our way to a new future. So I'm very bullish on it. And I also, though, realize having just been through what I've been through on the, you know, the the tech trends that, I mean, you know, when you see the internet come alive and you kind of start saying, well, why would anybody use this? Seriously. And then, you know, years later, we don't even question it. It's such a part of our life. So, you know, it's uh, totally on the yay AI side, but also just a very, very strong sense that we have to protect people and and shape the future. I really like what you said about vacillating back and forth from the pearl clutching to the like really excited thing because uh, Nicole and I are really trying to hold the center generally. But I think if we're we're being honest, we also go to that place of like, oh my gosh, this is so terrifying. I cannot believe this is where the universe is going right now <laughs> to, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Look at all the things I can do. And like, I'm more empowered and oh my gosh, I can do my job better. It's so nice to hear you like kind of go on that journey too. <laughs> it's a wild journey. In fact, I was listening to another podcast with a bunch of women who were in the governance space who were talking about it's like, especially in the in the governance world where we're talking about, you know, regulations and things like that. It's like standing in the middle of a tornado and trying to, you know, stand tall and stand strong in the midst of all the change, right? So, you know, I think we have to give ourselves grace that we're not going to just walk into this thing and not have mm. any kind of, you know, turbulence along the way. This part of the journey, because we are literally actively beta testing and training these programs, and, it, you know, in, in three years, in two years, in, in the next year, it's going to be better. But right now, 
we're like, we're, we're in a place where it's really fascinating. We don't know what's going around the corner. We, we really literally don't know what's around the corner. Deanna, like in that vein, we know it's going to be, it's going to change, but I'm wondering like what your opinion is on how much hype there is. Like I sat through a demo at work and the product had AI in the name, but there was no AI in it at all. And I'm like, where's the AI in this? Seriously. Just, and I'm sure you've seen that over the years, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anytime we think about tech transformations, we really have to think about where the money is coming from and where the money is going. The thing is, the PE firms and venture firms, the money goes where the AI is. And so every single SaaS organization that's out there, software as a service, which is really most of what we use right now, but every, you know, 67% of every SaaS organization has implemented AI in some way, right? Mm -hmm. Which means they slap the, you know, they slap something on it. They probably tune it with some sort of a gen AI tool and they call it AI enabled. And so it basically listens into conversations or watches keystrokes or whatever, which is part of the challenge and the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a hype cycle. We're a bit, I think we're a little bit, if you think of the Gartner hype cycle, we're on the, in the, a little bit of the trough of disillusionment right now, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Because people are recognizing the fact and, and folks like you who are AI literate, they're looking at these things and going, come on, really? Are you serious? So. It is very confusing, Janet, what AI means, because when mm. you first start your journey, if you're starting from, you know, let's say January of 2023, ChatGPT is out, right? This is the first real time you've experienced AI in your like life that you know of. You think that's AI. And then you start doing research and you're like, wait a second, we've had AI in some form for 50, 60 years. So what is, you know, like, what is the new thing that's happening right now? And I think that that's really confusing for people because what is new is, I guess, the generative AI side of things. But we have been using AI in some form for as long as we've had the internet. Well, well, 20 years ago, it, it really pretty much burst on the scene with, you know, Siri and with mm. like net, Netflix's algorithms and, and those kinds of things, you know, it was, you're right. It was 1955 when the term AI was coined, right? And so it's been around for a very long time. But what the confusing part is, yes, we have been using AI anytime we had a Amazon recommend a book or, or something like that. But at the same time, the difference is now we can actually we can control it and make it do things that we could never do before. I mean, there's a real difference between asking a question to ChatGPT or my friend Claude or or something like that and manipulating it and having it come up with things than to say, hey, Alexa, tell me what the weather is, right? So mm-hmm. so I think that's the challenge and the, the bright, shiny object are these generative models that actually let you speak into or type into and and have accessibility to the world's knowledge as biased as misogynistic as whatever you guys i mean seriously even even the new stuff is still just whacked so anyway so so yeah it is very confusing and i and that's why i applaud you for doing what you're doing right now and taking just this whole broad approach to bringing together resources for folks to explore the world of AI, because it's huge. But the real thing that is changing the landscape right now is having it built into faux or not, because it will be built into everything. So right now we have tools, and I think I may have already said this, but 67% of the SaaS tools already have AI of some sort built into them. SaaS is exploding around organizations. In fact, if you've got a company with 500 or fewer employees, you use 169 applications today. And if 67 of them have got SaaS in them, that means you're using 109 applications today that have Mm -hmm. some sort of AI in them. So all of those things coming together and fighting for and listening to and grabbing information is, is, you know, kind of 
in the pearl clutching sense, a data scientist or a data nightmare, right? A privacy mm-hmm. nightmare, an employee rights nightmare. But at the same time, you know, when you think about it, I think it's McKinsey who said it, there was going to be a $4.4 trillion upside to the fact that people are going to get more stuff done over time mm-hmm. because we're 20% more effective, right? And, and, and productive over time. This is the the rapid the rapidity and the accessibility are really I think what's changed. Yeah, how do you how do you suggest that people balance the risk and the opportunity of generative AI? First of all, doing what you are doing and helping people understand how these systems have been made and built and how they work is the most important thing. So. AI literacy is a number one. And then number two is critical thinking. We have to have a little bit you know, of our little tin hats on as we're using these tools. And we have to question the results that come out magically mm-hmm. after you know, my, maybe three yeah. seconds of work, right? And the other thing is, um, you know, we, we really have to start looking at and protecting our personal data. We're responsible for it. We are, as users, we are responsible for what we're getting out of these machines. The machines are not responsible. They don't have critical thinking skills. They're trained by people, and and those people have points of view. And so we really need to deepen our understanding of how the systems work. And as employers of anyone, we have to protect them with policies. We have to protect them with playbooks. We have to protect them with guidelines and guardrails. And they need to be educated as to how to use the systems that we make available as employers. And that's part of the the new way companies are going to have to behave in an AI-enabled world. It's very different from how we've behaved. It's almost like, you know, the pandemic change the way we work in terms of physically where we work, right? Generative AI is changing the way we work in terms of how we communicate with each other as teams, right? As leadership teams. And I think I may have said this to you too at one point when we first met, but, you know, talking about the fact that in an organization as a, as a leader in marketing, I was a CMO for, for many years, and I never talked to the, the chief legal officer until I had a a contract that I needed to have signed and reviewed, right? Sometimes marketers are really good at bringing in shadow IT. Hey, I'm just going to bring in Slack so I can talk to my extended team, et cetera. So sometimes I did that without talking to legal, right? Now we've got to have complete and very transparent conversations about how these systems are used throughout the organization because client data client and employee conversations, et cetera, et cetera, are really, really critically um, under scrutiny by these machine learning systems, right? So they're digging into data that, that, you know, is in our organization in ways that we never dreamt they would, you know, we would have access to or others would have access to. And so, you know, even some down to the degree that these 109 applications that have AI in them, is anyone in an organization actually looking at the terms of service in all of these systems and making sure they don't overlap or don't have holes in them or don't exclude things that our organizations want them to exclude? That's where I go into my, you know, governance mode, and our attorneys go into our, you know, a bit of a holy shit mode, pardon my French. I hope that's okay. But that's you know, okay. we do have those <laughs> modes, right? Where we, yeah. we we realize, you know, the the accessibility to data has never been better right now. So and I forgot to tell you guys this in my in my uh, origin story, but you know, when I worked for Enron for a couple of years, I actually <laughs> once walked into a, a conference room full of shredded paper in Houston. This is my favorite no Janet story. For the record, I am thrilled that it came up right now because Janet being at Enron is like <laughs> the best. Also, if you are of a certain generation, you might need to Google Enron. But 
it, they are the origin for the Sarbanes-Oxley rules around whistleblower yeah. hotlines and things like that, right? So, so yeah, when I was at Enron, I mean, you know, we had a lot of really, really smart people around us. And yet, you know, there were things that were going on that, that employees, you know, and I was a senior director there. I wasn't, you know, I was, I was, it was, it was a, it was a great place to meet really smart people, but the shenanigans that went on, and that's what we're sort of enabling here with the data that's accessible to folks, right? So I have that side of me that just gets really, really nervous around, you know, just letting it all go. So back to your question, educate yourself, educate yourself, yeah. educate yourself, and put your critical thinking hat on for heaven's sake, right? That's the thing. Yep. Go to a lot yeah. of AI Portland stuff every month. I love that you're plugging us. You're the greatest. <laughs> Did you see the announcement? And I I might be getting this wrong, so we need to fact check myself, but that the government, the federal government has said now that government organizations have to have like a chief AI officer. Yeah, I did see um, that announcement. Yeah. And is that is that a kind of technique? Like, are you cheering that on? Like, yes, yes. that's the right yes. thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I just read a statistic today for Fortune 500 boards of directors, 1.6% of Fortune 500 board of directors have actually someone in charge of AI in their organization. 1.6%. It's insane. I believe it though. I believe it. Right? Right. Well, we're all in the same place. We're just starting to explore, right? But for those of us who have been at this for a while, and then those of us who have a bit of the tin hat on, we just kind of go, come on, you guys, quick, let's jump on this. So yes, having a chief AI officer of some sort, even if they're not chief information security officer, CISO is generally that person in an organization that is, you know, either a technology or a finance or a healthcare org. But 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 seriously, we are all digital we are all digital businesses now, whether we sell coffee or whether we sell, you know, consulting or whatever. And we need to have that, that really Im- important side of our brain lit up at all times. Seriously. And as consumers, as you begin to put information into these systems, like for me, I would never speak in. I would never speak in at this point into one of these generative AI systems because I don't believe in giving anybody my voice. Now, I'm on this podcast. Anybody's going to be able to sample my six seconds of my voice because I'm talking over you guys, right? And I've been doing that for a long time. But to give it to the systems themselves and understand that, you know, voice sampling is going to, you know, enable anybody to to parrot me, uh, you know, that's just, it's scary. It really is. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I think we even hyped this at one of our last events and it makes me second guess because someone was describing how they use it as like an assistant. They'll be on a walk and they'll be talking into it and be like, just stream like you would if your friend or your assistant was walking with you and then get back to your desk and get action items like out of just conscious stream of thought. You know, Nicole, that is, and that is the way it should be, right? But right now, I don't believe that inside our organizations, we have the the wherewithal to protect that information yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think in six to 12 months, we'll have it and it'll be just, you know, that'll be nirvana, right? But right yeah. now, I think we're we're in a place where it's too early days. It really is too early days for me personally. What? What do you think that companies are overlooking in general? Is it just the education piece? That, like if, if there's one thing that you think every company like, oh, my Lord, they are not looking at this the right way. What is it? <laughs> I, that's so hard. <laughs> I know, right? I believe in you, though, Janet. <laughs> well, the first thing I did and the first thing we did as a group was create some HR policy guidelines. We have templates for prohibitive like do not use this in our organization yet or permissive like okay we know you're going to use this but here are some things to consider right and we put them up free on our website and it's surprising how few people are really thinking about at least put it in your employee handbook for heaven's sake right either stop them or give them permission but at least take a stand right now and then 
as you begin, because you will begin, if you're going to be a leader in, in any kind of industry, you have to adopt AI. But do it in a way that allows you the grace and your employees the ability to play first and then get on the track. We talk a lot about, you know, the AI exploration and, and getting to the summit, right? We got to start at base camp. We got to figure out where is everybody in an organization? Are our employees ready to take a trek up to the top of this mountain? Because it will be a trek in many ways, but it's also a really exciting thing to be able to go on this expedition, right? So to be very specific, the first thing employers of any kind of organization need to do, in my opinion, is get something in the handbook that protects you and your employees. And the second thing is start to explore where you want to go with this stuff, because we're all starting from different places on a path. Some of us are not even aware of where the path will go for us. And that's the thing that we have to explore carefully, but with guidelines and guardrails in place. We would never go up to the top of a, you know, Mount Everest without oxygen, for example, and, and crampons, right? So yeah. figure out where those things are for you and then let's go. And we that makes that. sense. We, we help organizations do that. You are helping organizations start those conversations. That's really, really important. Such a tough yeah. balance, man, of like, don't do this, but also please play and explore, you know? <laughs> but it has right? to be. It has to be, right? Well, you know, it's like it's like anything else. It's you're developing muscles around something that's new, and when you're starting out, you're going to fall down and hurt yourself. But you don't want to do it in ways where, you know, all of a sudden you're blindsided, like Sports Illustrated was with their partner, who they relied on for content, doing nefarious things like making stuff up, right? Yeah. Making people up. So you know, we we need to make sure that we're taking a really good critical look at our whole ecosystem as businesses and NGOs and government infrastructure. We got to make sure we're protecting ourselves, right? Janet, can you tell me, so I, I thought it was very interesting that the AIGG team has such diverse backgrounds. Some make a lot of sense to me, legal, risk management, hmm. data science. Anthropology is one that I understand intellectually. I wonder how, how that plays out like practically oh, for your team. It's so great. So Kathy is one of our, our team members, and she was one of the original uh, product managers at Nike when it first hmm. launched. So as an anthropologist, she looks at really big trends, really long cycle trends and that kind of thing. And so her point of view with us is oftentimes very settling, which is great because, you know, I'm all, ah, ah, we're into this and, you know, like we've just talked a little bit, but, but Kathy has a perspective of how especially humans have moved through the world and, and moved through transformations in the past that's been very, very helpful. Now, she's seeing the world in a way that she's never seen it before, believe me. And, you know, I get together with her for tea every few weeks and in between our meetings and, you know, I'm just shaking my head the entire time because, you know, she brings her, her latest research and, and we share and, and, you know, it's really interesting. But having Having that perspective, that really long-term perspective is really helpful as we're plotting our paths, you know, because everything feels so urgent right now, right? Does that answer your question, Megan? Because it's kind of yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean. Like she's, it yeah. seems like the, that perspective is a little grounding. Yes. Right? That this Definitely. moment is, there's a lot of churn, there's a lot of worry, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of excitement and hype, but it is like this one moment in a very long human history. Yes. And, and so having someone who has some perspective on that seems like it would be helpful. Wasn't it like Aaron Hockley, the photographer that Megan and I talked to, who was like, yeah, it is this moment when we look back, some of these things that were really like upsetting and confusing, we'll be like, oh yeah, there was some kerfuffle over there. <laughs> right. Probably won't was, end up being, yeah. We won't remember it as being such a big deal as we feel it in the moment right now. Please yeah. let it be so. Please. I, let it be so. I, I want. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, it was Aaron. He'll be in our panel on our our meetup on the 18th of April. So awesome. um, just a little plug for that if you're in the Portland area. Um, yeah, I really hope that he's right. That, you know, again, that's that kind of holding the center perspective, though, mm-hmm. that is like, okay, this, yeah, this, and, there's some you know, things here will even yeah. out. And everything moves on, right? That's the, the surety of the whole thing. Change is going to happen. And, and those of us who embrace the change and learn to live with it and learn to learn from it, we're going to be in a whole different place, even on April 18th, because that's 15 days away from when this is oh, being gosh, recorded. Right? It's right? Be a totally different world, right? <laughs> could be, right? <laughs> As we wrap up, if you could leave our listeners with one thought about AI in, in 2024, you know, what would that be? What would you want them to carry with them? Wow. You know, I know. I think I think I have to I have to say this from from where I'm sitting today. Please, please play with these systems, but be really careful with them. You know, please dig in, please learn more, please and but dog on, keep that human connection. And there's such great resources here that you two have helped create for the community you know there's never been a more important time i don't think that to to build rebuild the community and have the community be where it is it's just critical that was more than one thing that's okay (laughs) we can take more than one thing (laughs) well janet thank you Thank you so much for taking the time and going and giving all of your perspective from the very first mobile phone call to Enron to generative AI in 2024. Thank you for the opportunity. You know, you think through your career when you've been in it as long as I have. And, and, you know, it's really funny to figure out where we all end up. And so, yeah. you know, I'm excited to, well, I'll probably be dead by then, but when you get through your next 50 years or 40 or 30. <laughs> <laughs> think That's back okay. on this moment <laughs> you're gonna Jana, eventually you'll put your voice into ai and then we'll just still keep talking to you like yeah. you won't be here but we will still be like Janet, what do you is- think about this I want to say this is now every podcast, which is two, that Nicole has mentioned doing something like that for somebody. So this is clearly her Dr. Evil master plan here. Surround herself by AI versions of her favorite people. My own, like, battle with mortality. Like, my own, like, I don't want to lose anybody. Thank you again for listening to this episode of Supercharged by AI. Subscribe to get all the latest episodes and check us out at AIPDX.info for more information.